Welcome to the Connectfulness Practice Podcast. Here, we settle into the murky, tangled, and freaking hard parts of life to restore our relationship with the self so it can ripple out to the people we love, the work we do, and the world around us. If we can't fix what's wrong, then our grandchildren inherit it. In order to fix what's wrong, we have to talk about it. And we can't move that conversation forward if we're not willing to be real about where we are now. We have to push on the edges of what it means to connect. Otherwise, nothing will ever change. I'm your host, Rebecca Wong, and I'm here to guide you through a series of radically honest conversations about what it means to be truly human in all of its messy, beautiful, hilarious, and heartbreaking glory. In our collective effort of looking inward, we're starting to do the outward work to reconnect the world. While these discussions will guide you into the connectfulness practice, this podcast is not meant to be a substitute for the depth of work that you'd encounter with a licensed provider. If something in this episode touches you, reach out. That's where you initiate the ripple that restores relationships. Learn more about my connectfulness counseling practice and my online workshops at connectfulness.com. Today, I'm joined by Kelly McDaniel. Kelly is a licensed professional counselor and an author, and she specializes in treating women who struggle with relationships. You may remember her from episode 28, The Legacy of Chronic Loneliness. Mother Hunger didn't have a name until now. Kelly's upcoming book, Mother Hunger, out July of 2021, speaks to the millions of women who suffer with a lifelong emotional burden that adversely affects self-worth. Some of you will hear this term mother hunger and already know what it's all about. I hope this episode takes you a little deeper into your own healing journey. Hey everyone, I'm back here today with Kelly McDaniel. You may remember her from a past episode and We just had such a delicious conversation that I wanted to make sure that Kelly came back to talk about her new book and also because, hey, Mother's Day is coming. And one of Kelly's specialties is talking about something that she terms mother hunger. And I think a lot of us have a sense just hearing those words, what that's all about. And so that's what today's conversation is going to be about as well. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me back, Rebecca, and for giving the topic of mother hunger some time near Mother's Day. Yeah, I think it's really needed. I do too. Especially now. Yeah. Especially now as we emerge from a pandemic, but also (laughs) everyone I talk to who resonates with mother hunger starts about now to feel dread, to feel different um, degrees of grief that come out in different ways, right? Whether yeah. that's sadness or anger or hope, um, just to name a few. Yeah, yeah. And that's your when you're saying starts about now, you mean starts like as we lead into Mother's Day. Exactly. When yeah. we start seeing things in our inbox or <laughs> we start seeing advertisements about get your mother the perfect thing and like, okay. <laughs> There is not a Mother's Day card out there that is appropriate for women with mother hunger. Right. You know, one of the things about mother hunger that I think is so, from reading your book, I, I'm also kind of like thinking, you, you you write about this. And it's one of the things that I keep thinking about as I'm reading is how it, it's passed down generation after generation after generation. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. In fact, I think it's fascinating that um, when we're little, um, when we're in our mother's uterus, we're sharing a body, not just with her, but with her mother. Mm -hmm. And literally the, um, I'm not going to quote the science on this perfectly right now, but it's in the book. (laughs) We have traces of each other in the eggs. And so we inherit our mother's deprivation or joys. We inherit our grandmother's deprivation and joys. We inherit their trauma. We inherit what they've healed and we inherit what they haven't healed. But we don't always know that. It's not conscious. 
No, no, none of it is. Although it's exciting to see what's happening in the field of epigenetics and how it's becoming more and more uh, talked about. Yeah. I always, my, my brain always does one of those like little brain explosions. When I think about the science, like when my mother was in her mother's uterus, the eggs that made me were developing. Thank you. You said that beautifully. That's it. Right. It's like, boom. Yeah. Yeah. That's how connected we are generationally. And yeah. how embodied it is. Yeah. It is so embodied, that connection. It's not cognitive, right? <laughs> no. it, it is purely in the cellular memory of our DNA. Yeah. And so, you know, when you, when you kind of start talking about what this whole concept is, what mother hunger is about, you talk about a few really particular things. Like you talk about the need for nurturance and the need for food. Yes. Well, there are elements of mother hunger <clears throat> that are that I've given words to so that we can almost operationalize what it is because yeah. there is no definition of a mother anywhere out there in the world. In fact, I looked it up in the Cambridge Dictionary and I think the definition of a mother is someone who acts like a mother. <laughs> now, how is that helpful, right? Okay, so what I did is break down what is healthy mothering. What is it that we need as little babies and little mammals from a mother in order to develop an optimal brain um, and body attachment system? And what we need, number one, is nurturing, two, protection, and then eventually some guidance. So when you talk about nurturing, it, it includes food. Mm -hmm. Because the first language of love that babies experience that's nonverbal is through touch and through nourishment, literally being fed. Yeah. In fact, the root word of nurture is nutrir. Which, which is, is like nutrition. The, it Actually, it's the Latin word that's, that means to suckle. Huh. Nutrir actually means to suckle. So the root word of nurturance literally connects us to the breast. It connects us to the fact that as little babies, we have a powerful sucking instinct. That is so essential to who we are that um, it's connected with food. Hmm. Yeah. And so, so then I think of a whole bunch of different things, right? Like, and I'm thinking about my own personal life. I'm thinking about my clients. I'm thinking about how powerful food is as a way of both talking about things like love and talking about things like worth and value, right? And how we either can overdo it or we can withhold or we can feel shame if we, or we, you know, like there's so many different ways that food has all of these encoded stories about who we are in terms of what our relationship to it is. Exactly. The stories that food tell are the stories of love. Mm -hmm. So that means we might have had not enough. Yeah. We may have experienced love as being actually physically full. Mm -hmm. Like maybe love, we did not experience it through our mother's touch because there wasn't enough of it or her touch was frightening. So our first experience of what love might have felt like might have been when we were full of some sort of milk or formula. And for one minute or for one hour, we didn't feel pain because we were full. Mm -hmm. um, that became the substitute mother for many of us as infants is the feeling of fullness. So then when we're grown women, the sensation of fullness is so inextricably linked with love that to work with the epidemic of eating issues that so many of us have, I just have a huge respect for it because you're not going to unlink that unless you actually provide another source of love that's healthy. You know, and you're talking about fullness just now. You just gave me like, um, my podcast is called Connect Fullness, right? Mm. So I just I just had this whole different like understanding of what that made up word even means. And we interrupt this podcast to share a superhuman moment with you. <laughs> At this point in our conversation, I got pretty excited. And I think I leaned in towards the computer 
And my elbow might have like hit my mouse pad without my noticing it. And I think I stopped the recording here. But Kelly and I didn't notice that the recording had stopped for like another 20 minutes or so into our conversation. And then we had this time crunch and we wanted to finish the recording. But not knowing where we left off, we kind of took it from the top. And so human moment sharing it with you in full transparency and glory. And let's get back into the interview, knowing and understanding why things might feel the way they do. Welcome back, Kelly. (laughs) Won't this be interesting? Yes. (laughs) Human moment there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what that's bringing up for me just as I name it, and I think this is a part of this whole topic too, is our need and our our striving sometimes, especially as women, towards perfectionism, right? Right. There's this element of, oh no, I did something and, you know, it wasn't perfect and I'm going to be judged for it or like, so I'm just kind of naming and knowing that about all right, I didn't hit the record button or I didn't hit it right or some reason it wasn't recording and here we are. Well, talk about a universal experience after this past year of all of us needing to learn to use technology in maybe brand new ways or different ways to try to stay connected. And here you are with a Connectfulness podcast (laughs) and you've been using um, technology even before COVID and still... And still... We can have technological difficulties. Yeah. Well, sometimes the technology, I think, is just being human. I think so. Yeah. Yes. Mine mine has been very human this year. Yeah. So let's dive in. Let's start talking a little bit about what mother hunger is. I think it's one of those terms that we all, it's something you've coined. And yet, I think when we hear it, all of us kind of instinctively know it. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. That's my gut feeling. And I've seen it time and time again in my office when I'm working with a woman and I say, you know, this sounds like mother hunger to me. Mm -hmm. And there's that moment of recognition where in the middle of the room, there's a thud, which is the sensation of truth coming between two people. Ooh, the sensation of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of recognition, like, oh, that's it even though maybe no one had heard the word. So this is why I wrote the book, because I'd like for each woman who has mother hunger to find herself to feel seen in whatever degree, shape, or form that mother hunger is taking place in her body, because it will be unique to each each person with this hunger. Yeah. When you start explaining to people what mother hunger is. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're giggling already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm giggling because it does not usually make me someone anyone wants to invite to their dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> there's a heaviness to it. Oh, gosh, there's a heaviness to it. And I think given the nature of how we treat mothers and mm-hmm. motherhood in our culture, there's a, an aversion to even hearing the word mother. In fact, even in the science that I studied and put into the book, we'll say caregiver, we'll say parent, we'll, we will avoid the word mother at all costs because it is such a taboo topic um, for many, many valid reasons, but for many reasons that are, are so patriarchal, that are about erasing the primacy of women and of mothers. Because if we hold this role of nurturing little ones as central as we need to, it's going to mean a lot of systemic change needs to happen. So Mm. it's a large problem. People don't want to talk about it. It brings up so much stuff that's primitive, but that's also political. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really feeling that one in my bones in a lot of different ways. One of the things that I experienced while reading the book was um, in, in some ways I was thinking, oh gosh, so much of what Kelly's kind of recommending in some ways that all of us should have experienced as little ones growing up in the system that we live in is so hard for so many to attain. 
Yes, I would say almost impossible because yeah. first of all, there's a lack of recognition, right? Mm -hmm. So mothers, children, grandmothers don't even know. There is no job description for being a mother. There's no even definition for it. When I look it up in the Cambridge Dictionary, the definition of mother is someone who mothers. That tells us nothing. It implies that simply because we have memory glands, we know what to do. So I had to come up with a definition. And in doing so, in realizing what all of us need as little babies, as mm -hmm. little mammals, we need three things that are essential to our brain development and attachment. We need nurturing. We need protection. Yeah. And we need guidance. But here's the truth. So does a mother. Mm -hmm. If a mother isn't receiving adequate nurturing, she's not safe, and she doesn't have good guidance, she can't give it to her little one. And think of all the misguidance that mothers receive from so-called experts who aren't really experts in attachment. So their ideas about whether you should pick up your baby and comfort your baby, when to feed your baby, how to train your baby to go to sleep, are causing lots of problems for maternal instinct, for baby's well-being, and women have to almost go back and reclaim how to be a mother from women who have stepped away from these experts and followed their own intuition. Right. It's hard to do. And intuition for generations upon generations of women who have been taught to not listen to the things that they feel or think. Right. Right. This actually started in the early 1900s. Um, we can trace some of this back to Dr. John Watson, who was the father of behaviorism, and he was studying psychiatry um, in 1902. By 1920, he's in practice. He considers himself a parenting expert, and he's writing for... Harper's Bazaar, Cosmopolitan. He basically becomes the first pop psychologist. Well, this guy <laughs> um, really didn't like anything about Freud, and that's fine, but he really liked Pavlov and felt you could train a child just like a dog. So he actually gave parents this advice. Do not shut your children. Pat them on the head when they achieve something extraordinary. Don't put them on your lap. Don't kiss them goodnight. This is the antithesis of nurturing. I can't imagine treating my own children that way. It's so counter instinctual. And yet this guy's ideas are still, we can still see seeds of this kind of thinking in sleep training experts who really think you can lay a baby in the crib to cry and that that's okay. Hmm. This infant has no idea why they're alone. They're not designed to be alone. You can train a dog to eventually stop crying, and you can train a child to eventually stop crying. But that profound need for nurturing that does not get met in the wee hours of the night when we're all afraid will haunt us, and we grow up with a sense of an unmet need for nurturing. Yeah. And I think this is one of those places where both this conversation and the book is one that you know, we're really listening to, I hope we're listening to, dear listeners, from a framework of perhaps this is where your emptiness and your your mother hunger comes from. And um, this is the history behind it. And this is necessary to talk about so that we can grow. And it's not meant as a critique of parenting. And I just kind of want to hold everybody who's listening to this really warmly and just remind us all of that piece, because I think this this is tough information in a lot it's of very, ways to confront. Very difficult to confront. And I'm glad we revisited it because we were talking about it so beautifully 30 <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> I know. Um, so I'm glad you brought it back because I I really didn't write a parenting book. No, you didn't. That's that's not what this book is. You, you wrote a reparenting book, as I like right? to think of it. Yeah, I love that word because what I had hoped and what I still hope is that by talking a bit about what the essential developmental needs are that we all have, yeah, um, it's not about blaming mothers who were also first daughters. It's really more about being able to recognize what was lost 
so that we can heal it and reclaim it. Mm -hmm. And we can't heal what we can't see. And we can't talk about what we don't know. And so there is a lot of- That that sounds like my podcast intro right there. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's true though. We can't, we can't, we can't heal what we don't know. And we can't talk, if we can't talk about it, we can't do much with it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so this is getting to the root of it. It's getting to the root of these things that for so many of us, in many ways we're missing. And I think it's, it's probably true for equally for, for all people. I think Mm -hmm. women maybe um, culturally at least feel it differently. Um, But these things are, are pieces like, um, our need for nurturance, our need for guidance, our need for protection, and what manifests inside of our beings when those things don't show up. When a woman is not protected, Kelly, what does that look like when she becomes an adult? How does how can that manifest? Good. I want to answer that, but I also want to address something you said that's so profound, mm-hmm. which which is, yes, regardless of our gender, we're mm-hmm. going to feel and have mother hunger because little baby boys and little baby girls need the exact same thing, nurturing and protection. Where this wound, this mother hunger may start to be different is that as boys grow and look for guidance, they don't necessarily look to their mothers for that. It's a bonus, but but for a girl growing up, it's essential. Mm-hmm. So that's where it starts to change a little bit. And then another difference I see is that as adults – women may become more aware of their mother hunger sooner because we're not getting mothered in our relationships. Whereas a lot of grown men are. Mm -hmm. So they may not really know this because the women in their lives are trained to mother them. Right. At least in, in heteronormative kind of um, precisely relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And And I think to, to go outside the gender, um, language of male and female, let's look at it from an attachment perspective, that folks who are avoidantly attached may not even know they have an attachment problem because folks that are in anxiously attached that are usually their partner are doing all the mothering. Right. So I like to think about it in terms of over-functioning and under-functioning, sure. right? Who's over-functioning? Who's under-functioning? There tends to be one of each. And sometimes that is um, more evident than others, but I think a lot of daughters, adult daughters with mother hunger, we first learn to overfunction from rescuing our mother. Mm. And then we go on to rescue others. Yeah. 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 We first learn to function, to overfunction from rescuing our mother. Yeah. 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 There's a truth in there. There's a huge truth in there because even as little ones, we knew if our mother was frightened, we knew if she was still herself too young to look out for us. We may not have cognitively been able to make sense of it, but we compensated Mm -hmm. so that she would love us by growing up too soon or by nurturing her um, or finding out. By not making waves, by not upsetting her, by keeping the house or our room or whatever clean or whatever the thing is that we tended towards to do so that it's the so that, so that we could take care of her, so that she would so feel that, better. So that we would have the illusion that we have a mother. Mm-hmm. Because what the fantasy is inside every child is if I do this for my mother, she will then act like a mother and I'll have a mom. Poor little one. Yes, we are so resilient. We can go through mm-hmm. all kinds of psychobiological gymnastics to please and to preserve the idea that we have a mother. And this is why a lot of us end up as adults being able to um, adapt to all kinds of people um, because we first learned how to adapt to missing nurturing or missing protection or missing guidance. And in the case of third degree mother hunger, perhaps missing all three. Yeah. Yeah. And so you just brought up third degree mother hunger and that's very, you talk about mother hunger then on this continuum, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. there's different kinds of, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, when we say third degree, we we get the sense of burns, right? So there's, there's a different quality 
Definitely a different quality. Third degree mother hunger is the most severe form of mother hunger because it not only involves lack of nurturing, lack of protection, lack of guidance, but also attaching to a caregiver who was frightening. Yeah. So when our first love is also someone who terrifies us, our neural pathways for bonding and our neural pathways for fear, fleeing, get a, get triggered at the same time. And this creates one of the most powerfully toxic neuro, neurochemical cocktails that the body can tolerate. Um, so we dissociate at a very young age. Um, we don't know who we are when we grow up. Um, and nobody wants to talk about it. So instead, many women with um, third-degree mother hunger get labeled as borderline. They might get labeled as bipolar. And they may have clinicians that so don't understand this attachment injury that the therapist kind of throws up their hands and refers them out to someone else. So well-meaning people who really wanted to help may just not have had the skills and the tools to help because this is not taught in medical school or counseling programs. Um, Instead, what's taught are names like disorder. And this is not a disorder. Women with third degree mother hunger are actually resilient, resilient people who learned before they could walk, before they could talk, how to adapt to a caregiving environment that was so threatening that there was no good way to behave. Right. And so a lot of people with this degree of mother hunger in order to heal. Mom's not needed for healing, but for many, as I was reading your book, I was kind of taken by, it seemed that there were at least two factors that seemed to lead them into their own healing. One is their mother's death, and another is their own children becoming like teenagers. Yeah, I think because our body protects us, from knowing that our mother is um, not able to be a mother, we don't always come to healing from a place of consciousness. Yeah. This wound, this wound is deeply buried, right? So, for some people, they accidentally bump into healing mother hunger because their mother dies, and it becomes yeah. very clear that I'm motherless. Um, but a lot of women have symptoms of being motherless, and mom is still alive, so it's hard to identify why am I it feels like I'm the problem, not that there was something in the mother caregiver relationship that was harmful. And so much of the time, one of the things that's happening is that there's like a toxic shame. There's, there's this idea that the, the, the child, perhaps now a grown woman is carrying that says there's something about me that's defective. That's how we have to believe when we're little. We can't mm-hmm. see our mother as protective. That would be too ter- as defective or compromised or wounded. We can't see it. It would le- it, we would feel orphaned. So yeah. our body protects us from this information. And one of the ways that we are protected is by being pretty convinced that it's our fault mm-hmm. and that if we just act a certain way, she'll be okay. But I want to just revisit that um, the different degrees of mother hunger and how they may feel in adulthood. For Mm -hmm. example, let's say we had a mother who was very protective of us um, and really quite a guide, taught us to read while we were little, um, maybe enrolled us in all kinds of activities, but she herself was not very nurturing. She was maybe distant, removed, maybe cold. Um, I find that mothers like this had mothers who might have been too involved. They they may have had mothers who needed a friend and they didn't like that so much. It, it felt suffocating. So then when they become mothers, they give their children a whole lot of space, not a lot of touch, not a lot of nurturing. So as an adult, this may feel like a craving for physical touch that seems mm-hmm. somewhat insatiable. Um, that can come out in all ways of becoming sexual that we don't actually choose, but fall into almost as a way to get touch needs met that we didn't even realize we were doing. Right. So that's an example of what it might feel like to have grown up without enough nurturing. Um, Food is also inextricably linked with lack of nurturing. For many little ones who didn't have adequate nurturing, the first sensation of what love felt like was a full belly. 
Um, and so that follows us into adulthood and we may confuse food and love and either restrict or overindulge as a way to compensate for lack of a relationship. Mm. And then moving on to protection, let's say we had a mother that was super nurturing. She was playful. She held us. She was so happy to have a baby. But let's say that in her life, she wasn't really safe. And I'm thinking this is really epidemic because most of us as women know what it feels like to walk down the street and not be safe. We've grown up with a sexual alarm system in our body. We're always on high alert. We know that we are sexual prey. So many well-meaning mothers aren't feeling enough safety within their own body, within their own life even. Maybe they're with a dangerous partner. Um, therefore, they have trouble protecting their children. Yeah. Not because they don't love them but because they are not themselves able to be safe. That's a different form of mother hunger. And those adults are going to grow up feeling kind of a constant sense of anxiety that just feels like basic to the personality. As in adulthood, it can become panic attacks um, and it will get more intense, but it just feels normal. Yeah. Okay. And so then the third one, guidance. Let me just summarize it quickly. Maybe you had a mother that protected you. Maybe you had a mother that nurtured you. But then about the time that you reached um, junior high, you realized you needed someone you could admire. You wanted someone to look up to, to kind of give you a roadmap for becoming a woman. And there was something about your mother that you couldn't do that with. Mm -hmm. um, the example I use in the book is um, from a memoir. And it's it's all about a daughter who whose mother started having an affair and took her on as her confidant. Um, so the daughter then loses her innocence and loses her ability to have friends her own age because her mother needed a friend, a, friend. a secret keeper. And that is an inversion of the mother's role, and that is poor guidance. So, okay, those are the three things I just wanted you, your readers to have because they all – are why there are such unique forms of mother hunger. And when you miss out on all three and have a mother who's threatening or gone and you're not protect, you're not safe, that's third degree. Yeah. Yeah. And it creates this massive confusion in the person who's growing up in this way, because this person who you want to be able to go to, you can't go to because they're the form of, they're the source of this trauma, of this fear that lives inside of you. That's the essential bind of third degree mother hunger that yeah. you're born to attach, you're designed to attach to your mother. And if your mother is frightening, your body thinks, I've got to get away from her. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to do both. Yeah. Except to dissociate. So that's where dissociation begins. Yep. And it's why it's so healthy because it's helping you to move away from the thing that's so scary. Yeah. It's yeah. very resilient, very mm -hmm. adaptive. It's mother nature doing for us what we need. Yeah. Yeah. And as we take on this healing journey, there's a few specific phases, right? So for those who mother hunger feels like it's a really resonant term and you want to do some work around this, one of the first pieces of this work is about kind of learning the language, about getting your story straight, about recognizing that that this is part of your story because it's so, so covert. It's so something that we don't talk about. Exactly, which goes back to we can't heal what we can't name and we can't treat what we can't see. Yeah. So bringing it out into visibility and finding a way to have someone validate that this is real, help you name which part applied to you, is one of the most uh, powerful stages of healing. Yeah. Yeah. And then what do you find is the next stage, Kelly? Where do people tend to need some support following that? I think the next stage is twofold. Mm -hmm. We've got to address the apology ache, and we have to address disenfranchised grief. And so I'll just say a couple of words about what that means and why I wrote about it in this book. Yeah. I wrote about it as I did with everything else. So every woman healing this has recognition of, oh, that's why I do that. But specifically the apology ache and disenfranchised grief, I wrote for the clinician, 
to have as well, because too many well-meaning clinicians don't understand these two important elements of roadblocks to healing. Like this is what gets in the way. Yeah. Okay. So once we've got a name, we've removed one roadblock, but then there are these other roadblocks and one of them is an apology ache. And that is basically the yearning, the pining that our mother will see the ways that she couldn't be there for us. Maybe she hurt us and say, I'm sorry, acknowledge that that wasn't your fault. That was, that was what I couldn't do and make some repair efforts. Right. So I think about this sometimes in, in terms of like a, a kind of like magical thinking that the mother is going to turn around and be accountable all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. And if a mother's doing some of her own healing work, it does happen. I, I yeah. One of the greatest joys I have is working with mothers of adult children who they're now finally healing their own mother hunger because their mother died. And they realize, oh my gosh, I didn't do this for my children. But then I can now. Yes, it's never yeah. too late. It's never too late. So it's beautiful to watch. But a mother can and will sometimes do that. But generally, what I'm when I'm working with a woman, I say, let's not wait for your mother to apologize. Let's look at this apology ache, name it for what it is. It is a fantasy. It probably gets played out with your friends and lovers as well, where you just want everybody to do the repair work for this primitive heartbreak that no one really can see. Or, And so we start to put closure on that fantasy. And that helps healing a lot. Um, The other thing is the disenfranchised grief. So when we grieve, we need to grieve in community. That's because we're human, not because we're broken. It's because we're human. We need community for grief. And that's why if you're facing a cancer diagnosis, it's really a good idea to go to a cancer support group. When you're facing mother hunger, where do you go? Mm. Where do you find other people who can talk about this with you, who can grieve with you, who can say, oh, that happened to me too. Like that did, we don't have that. And so part of what happens is the grief that's within every daughter who's got mother hunger freezes and waits. It waits until the right support is available. And if a therapist understands that mm-hmm. and can help a client identify the grief and find places for it to thaw, then progress will happen and healing will unfold. But many therapists don't realize that's what's happening. They think instead they've got a client who's untreatable. They think they've got a client who's resistant and they will th- slap a diagnosis on it perhaps right. so that they either best case scenario um, go get more training to help this client or worst case scenario, they say, well, I can't treat you. Um, I'm going to send you out of this practice. So I I think a lot of women have suffered even with male well-meaning clinicians who didn't understand that disenfranchised grief is an element of this injury. Right. The fact that we don't know that yeah, where to go, where where we can find people who have similar experiences. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we have a lot of work to do. Um, first we have to be okay that we're naming this as a society. And that's a tough one because, you know, when I bring up mother hunger, like I said, I'm, I'm, nobody wants me at their dinner party. Um, we live in a culture that doesn't want to really address the reality of this and prefers to fantasize about mothers. Um, and when we see this with mother's day coming up where yeah, we do. there's this kind of universal hallmark sentiment that every mother is lovely and perfect and sacrificial. Um, And yet every woman I've worked with with mother hunger says that trying to find a card for Mother's Day is one of the worst experiences of the year. Mm -hmm. Every year it comes up and it's a new opportunity for grief. And that grief might look like sadness. It might look like rage. It might look like hope. If I finally do it right for her this Mother's Day, she'll be nice to me. It's just a mess. And it could look like a collapse. For sure. Like depression. Yeah. Um, And a lot of that's that frozen grief. And Mm -hmm. women think they're lazy. They think I'm a bad daughter. And what it is, is the body's taking all this energy to keep the grief buried. Mm Because there's no place for it to go, especially on Mother's Day. So my hope for this episode, Kelly, is that our listeners hear this and take it in and have some element of 
Oh, I'm not broken and I'm not alone. Exactly. Exactly. And for women who are both a mother and a daughter right now, and hearing this on multiple levels, that there is hope for change and repair. A daughter never outgrows her desire for her mother. Um, and that this is a systemic issue. This is not an individual mother issue. This is right. no one's fault other than a culture that doesn't give a mother the same nurturing, the same protection, or good guidance that she needs to give her child. Hmm. That feels like a really perfect place to land. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us again for the second time. And congratulations on the release of your new book, Mother Hunger. When will it be available, Kelly? It is going to be available July 20th. Um, awesome. And it's available yeah. for pre-order now, right? It is on Amazon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. we'll have a link to that in our show notes as well for folks if they want to pre-order a copy. And thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you so much for having me and for your very compassionate, warm tone and embrace of the topic and of your audience. Thank you. So that wraps up today's episode. It's my hope that this episode offered those of you that needed it some recognition for those lonely places, lonely parts inside of you, so that you know that you're not alone on this healing journey. Those who are interested can learn more at kellymcdanieltherapy.com or by following Kelly on Instagram at kellymcdanieltherapy. You can learn more about my connectfulness counseling practice and my online workshops at connectfulness.com. And if you haven't already, check out the new podcast that I'm co-hosting called Why Does My Partner? We'd love for you to hop on over, give us a listen, and send us listener questions over at whydoesmypartner.com. I want to express my deep gratitude for Sarah and Chris Ferris, the musicians behind the beautiful soundtrack for the Connectfulness Practice podcast, which they recorded and mixed at Kidney Stone Studio. And more gratitude for Little Green Art House for all of our post-production needs. This podcast is produced by me, Rebecca Wong, and copyrighted by Connectfulness Counseling. Stay tuned for another episode next month. Take good care.